Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is a special Christmas Day episode of Blown Speakers, episode 75. And we're welcoming back again, who you may remember from last Christmas, right? Ian Martin and Julian Bielka. Thank you for joining us again, guys. Thank you as well. And Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I'm ha happy to see the sweater again, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> how many how many years have you been rocking that sweater on Christmas? I don't know. I've had it for that many years, but you know, it's, I do only have the one, so it's um, <laughs> yeah, it's always going to be the same one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again next year, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when when else can you wear it, right? So it's got to be <laughs> this season. Well, you can wear it anytime, but it means something different when you wear it in June or something, doesn't it? Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, I was very um, delighted with uh, your selection this time. Uh, the Fiery Furnaces 2004 album, Blueberry Boat. What an album. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, quite an interesting album. And... To me, right, yeah. <laughs> it strikes me as difficult to talk about, so I, I'm very uh, happy that you guys have volunteered to talk about it. So, uh, yeah, why did you choose Blueberry Boat? Mm. Oh, that's a that's a starting question to start with. Like, okay, I'm trying not to to compare Blueberry Boat to other al albums because, like, I'm gonna get crazy. But like, no, no, okay, it's as good as. Pet Sounds, Revolver, The First Velvet on the Ground. Okay, this album is uh, historical. He's a, it's a, a true masterpiece. And for me, okay. You wow. were going to say it's a fucking masterpiece. Yeah. And you stopped yourself, didn't you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very important album for me since like uh, 18 years, right? Um, mm. And yeah. yeah, but it's hard to um, to know how to start with like it's hard to describe just the feeling of listening to this for the first time. And like I, I was familiar with the band from their first album already at this point. And the first album was the first album has a lot of kind of eccentricities to it. But I think you can kind of like when the when the first album was released and when the band were first sort of introduced it was kind of coming off this wave of bands um this sort of post white stripes wave of like us bands that were kind of getting hip in the uk and um i think that we were kind of sold them a little bit as a, a bit of a white stripes thing it's like a actual real brother and sister um there's this kind of blues garage element to sort of underscoring a lot of the songwriting and a lot of the sort of melodies that they use and things like that and you could with the first album you could just about hear it as being this sort of like eccentric version of that slightly more sort of slightly weirder version of that and then this comes out and it just sort of it's like what well, this is not what we were sold at all hmm. um it's, it's really hard to just describe how sort of mind-blowing this album was to mm. me at the time yeah mind-blowing is a, the right um adjective it's uh <laughs> but how to explain why it's like um it's an album that it's very difficult to have a big picture of this album i think right mm. that's one of the things i'd say about it it's um you just lose yourself in details one little detail here one little detail there you can't really listen to it as a sort of they, you can't zoom out and get a picture of it you mm. zoom out and you just see chaos it's only when you zoom into the very fine details that you can see mm -hmm. how brilliant it is i think yeah, for, um, for me, what's difficult with this album, it's um, it's it's full of paradox. Like uh, it's full of uh, references. It's a like a history book of pop music, and uh, in the same time, it's also very fresh and very new. And like like you said, like mind blowing at the time. So I, I think 
I'm gonna talk about a lot of um, the, 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 the huge um, amounts of paradox in this uh, in this album. Um, and so it's hard to talk about it like because like yeah, it's uh, full of contradiction, but like there's no contradiction contradictions uh, anymore in the same place. <laughs> well, that's a very wise point. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's full of contradictions, but there's no contradictions anymore. Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> like, you know, very like a Hegelian kind of sure. um, dialectics, dialectical process. Mm. Which, uh, yeah, it, it, it's it, it's a Hegelian dialectic that vigorously refuses to reach synthesis. <laughs> you know? It's just it's all in it, it's just all in the conflict between. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's um, it. <laughs> let's see. I guess Ian, can you give me one example of detail? You said it's all about these little details. Can you just give me one? I mean, I think I know what you mean, but. Um, good question. Like, th there are a lot of different ways. I mean, I, I I guess I tend to kind of focus in on on lyrics, which is a, a very difficult thing to do on this album as well, just because of the kind of you know deliberately kind of disconnected way that it's mm -hmm. structured. Um, with the lyrics, you'll find that there's uh, like what, probably one of the most coherent songs on here is um, Chief Inspector Blancheflower, right? It's like 10 minutes long and it's really three songs. Um, you've got this opening part, the first part of it, which I have no idea what's going on about at all. And then suddenly, just out of nowhere, he goes, so then I joined the police force. Oh, yeah. And then like it just completely cuts. Like um Eleanor starts singing, and she is this sort of she's a TV detective from like a, a British sort of 1980s or 90s um sort of Sunday evening kind of detective drama, like Inspector Morse or something like that. And in this solving small town mysteries in this little village in England somewhere and um you know it's just sort of comical how sort of you know as it just plays through these kind of like mystery cliches and then again like she sort of it reaches a sort of climax doesn't really make a lot of sense and then she's like um what is it I I sat down for a woodpecker cider with the local fratricider and then it cuts again back to Matthew and it's like again vaguely connected he's like telling this story about going to see his brother but then his brother is dating his ex-wife mm. and mm. you know he's like you know I started seeing Jenny my Jenny mm. and looked down at the floor so mm. you know damn well she ain't your Jenny no more mm. <laughs> you know? And there's this vague sense that some sort of murder occurs. Either he murders his ex-wife or he murders his brother or both of them. But it's, ne it, it, it's not quite clear. But it's, it's like they kind of played this, you know, that game where you'd like write something and then fold a bit of paper over. Yeah. And you only see the last line and then the next person has to continue. Uh, yeah, Exquisite Cops. It. Is it Exquisite Cops. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's like, they, it's like they were playing that game. Um it's this very kind of fragmented storyline. It doesn't make any kind of narrative sense. Mm. The kind of individual parts don't really make much narrative sense. Mm. Um, key information is missing or it contradicts itself. Um, mm. But it's all kind of, um, I don't know, it's just this, this mad stream of consciousness that mm -hmm. runs mm -hmm. through the whole song with these two sharp turns that kind of shift it from one narrative frame to another narrative frame mm. and um there's elements of parody but there's also elements of you know like it, it goes from this sort of absurdist parody of the um british detective drama straight to this sort of you know kind of like kitchen sink realism 
sort of melodrama um, of like the guy and his brother. And so that's part of it. It's like, you don't really make get any sense looking at it, but you go into any of these individual details. There's some beautiful phrasing in there. There are some very funny kind of one-liners and things in there. Um, there are these little details of emotional life that come out at you without ever really telling you a cohesive story. Yeah, but I'm feeling a bit like uh, um, like uh, reassured because, like for me, like um, I was like, okay, I don't understand any of the the, the lyrics, <laughs> but like as you said, like when you listen to 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 it, like uh, like a psychoanalyst maybe listen to his patient, like with mm. a floating attention, mm. and you can get some like funny stuff, some gags or some uh, touching um uh, touching stuff moving stuff and uh yeah i think it's the, maybe the the way i listen to this album like mm. not on a like um pure focused attention because it's like it's not possible but mm. uh, like yeah to to catch some some little things yeah like musically it does the same thing like if you listen mm -hmm. to the title track um just the first couple of minutes of the title track there's not a lot of um singing in that part but just like musically it's jumping around amongst all of these different ideas and it's just firing them mm -hmm. at you one after mm -hmm. the other and none of them really seem to lead into any kind of overarching thing maybe maybe there is like if your mind is a bit more kind of musically attuned the minds you know i'm not a musician but it's you know it fires all these little ideas at you and every one of those ideas is kind of catchy and fun in its own right, but they don't necessarily kind of play together yeah. in a sort of, in an obvious cohesive structure. It's kind of, it's different from, it's easy to compare it to prog rock, but it's very different from prog rock, I think. Oh, no, it's funnier. It's, <laughs> uh, prog rock it's is more, kind of funny as it's well. It's more like, playful so. and funny. Yeah, but it, it doesn't have that kind of like, orchestral or cinematic grandeur to the there's no sweep to it it's all in these like it's very up close and these tight little details mm -hmm. um yeah, that's true. Yeah. maybe i mean there, there's a bit of maybe stuff like the cardiacs or something mm -hmm. just in the the sheer intensity of just like firing one thing after another at you maybe but yeah it's, it's, a, sound like it's, it's a firework of uh, mm -hmm. of ideas like too too many ideas in in, in one minute like a, more than like a any bands uh, lifelong yeah. amount of ideas we already sound like just talking about the album we already sound like the album you know <laughs> just sort of... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, wait so julian what's the what would be an example of the paradox you're talking about or the oh yeah but, well for example um as i said like the the, the er reduction like the all the the rock and pop music from the Beatles in one album, mm. in one album, and something very fresh and, and not pedantic, not snobbish. That was, I, I think, the risk of that kind of uh, very ambitious albums, mm. like to to sounds like okay, man, I'm gonna teach you what rock music he, is or pop music is, and no, it's super fresh, it's uh, innocent in a certain way, but also very um, like. Uh, how do you how do you say full of uh, history references like the most obvious is the the, the velvet underground guitar on uh, on Stray Street yeah uh, uh, on Blueberry uh, on Stray Street and on Blueberry Bob like the European sounds uh, uh, kind of guitar like but that's full of reference and also it's very fresh um so this this is one of the paradox it's funny but sometimes very uh touching too uh mm -hmm. very moving and um it's a difficult album i know lots of people can't really uh, get into it but it's also very entertaining like it's fun for me it's like a, it's, uh, okay um I, I we know that um uh, they wanted to us to to, to to have pleasure listening to this music and today is christmas so like uh, it's a very gener generous band right so <laughs> i don't know if we love uh, fiery Fales enough 
But I'm sure they are, they love us very much. I think you love them enough. Ah, oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you, you mentioned earlier about um, you said like pet sounds. You you mentioned that as a, a reference. I, I think I was just thinking that the the album it reminds me of like more than pet sounds is Smile. Oh yeah, and not just not the finished version of Smile that Brian Wilson eventually made, but these the kind of like fan made bootleg attempts mm -hmm. at trying to recreate what they yeah, imagine the smile might have been intended to be uh, that yeah. like used to appear gradually through the years like when it was still this famous lost album it sounds like a kind of mid 80s smile bootleg oh that's you know that's really, yeah because pet sound is very co korea mm. um, and yeah. yeah and it sounds like a fan bootleg of the lost bits of the broken pieces of smile mm -hmm. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah. It's a, a question I would like to uh, ask them. For example, the, the the balance between pure improvisation, um, some something like a, a vortex of ideas, and and the architecture of this album, because it sounds as well very uh, structured in some way, like mm -hmm. as you say, like for songs like like Chris Michael or uh, mm -hmm. Chief Inspector of Blan Blanche Fleur. I know that the uh, they know what they're doing mm. more or less but yeah. i think there's a, a tension between like um savage improvis improvisation and structure I they sound like they're having fun like the bands sound like they're having fun while they're mm. making it and playing yeah. it and things i I, th I also think it's beautiful that there was this period in you know musical history in the early 2000s when somebody in the music industry had the money and was on enough cocaine that mm. they threw money at like these people <laughs> making this completely fucking batshit insane music and they somehow managed to kind of ride out like eight or nine albums out of doing this mm. kind of stuff you know this isn't even their weirdest album like the one they did after this is much much stranger but mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah I, I, I agree there's something I'm, I'm very sensitive like uh, we can feel the joy of uh, of making music, making art, creating, um, you know, in a kind of yeah, wide way. But yeah, yeah, uh, and it's not that common that that sense of pleasure they have and the, the pleasure they they give to us, they gave us. Yeah, I mean, I it, I know this is like. Um... I've been on here talking about this band several times now, but it's the same kind of thing I get from Guided by Voices, mm. um, especially like the early sort of um, lo-fi Guided by Voices where, you know, the albums are just like ricocheting around amongst mm. all these half-finished ideas of songs mm. and stuff like that. But they, there's something else in there as well. There's like what, what Julian's saying, that they know exactly what they're doing, mm. but I th I'm, I'm sure that there's a, there's a tremendous sense of... Um, awareness but it, it's this ha having the maybe having the confidence i don't know if it's confidence but ha or the the assurance to kind of to let themselves kind of take their hands away and to to let themselves lose control as well like they, they could he could be making this making very very refined mm -hmm. intricate and very cohesive music if you wanted to but it just sounds like he's having too much fun not doing that <laughs> mm. <laughs> i'm really curious about the process mm. yeah. there, the composed music out there mm. um, i would like to, to ask them yeah i mean especially on this album I, I know that like typically i think matthew was the one who was producing it and slamming it all together in the, the studio maybe the main songwriter with eleanor in charge of mostly in charge of the lyrics and singing um but I, I don't know to what extent it was that clearly divided because you know i um i've heard i've um i have one of eleanor's solo albums i i've seen eleanor live solo um mm -hmm. and she definitely you know you can hear the fiery furnaces in what she does but it's this much more like the pop side of the band comes out much more strongly in her solo stuff i've never heard any of matthew's solo stuff uh, you said before he, he was the, 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 the mental guy the, the, the like really seeing lots of experiments it's, it's, it's incredible you know like one of his solo albums it was like 
it's, it's just called Solo or Solos or something. And he released it as like a kind of a subscription that you buy at the beginning of the year. And then over the course of the year, he released eight albums. Like the album was like an album in eight parts, but it's like eight individual albums. And each album was made only using one instrument. And it's a different instrument for each album. Wow. <laughs> and, um, so you know that, that's the that's what happens. That's what he does when he's kind of uh, set free, <laughs> you know, um, from the need to make kind of coherent pop albums like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, is he is he still in Paris? Do you know? I heard he moved to Paris. I don't know. No idea. Oh. I, I don't know what he's done in the past. Kind of. Mm, well, like I mean, the last thing I know he's done, I guess, was the Fiery Furnaces kind of reunion because they they put out a single a couple of years ago. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, the, 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 this kind of unleash creativity <laughs> and uh, yeah. like structured pop song. He's a man full of ideas. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. I'll talk us. I'll talk us into it a bit for um, the uninitiated, right? So the Fiery Furnaces members are Matthew Friedberger and Eleanor Friedberger, right? They formed in New York City, even though they're from the Chicago area, right? They're from the Oak, Oak Park area of Chicago. But so I listened to an interview with her this morning. She was talking about um, there was a, an old podcast. She said she moved to New York City and she started a band with a, one of her friends was the drummer. And then she felt she needed Matthew. So she invited Matthew to move there. And that's how they started in in New York City. Right. And um, yeah, I think this this photo was used a lot to promote uh, Blueberry Boat, if I remember correctly. Um, but this so it was their second release right or at least their second album mm. and um so did you both of you heard uh gall's birds bark before you heard blueberry boat no no i i, I, I did but he didn't yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, blueberry road was the first album i listened to and it was whoa okay yeah <laughs> that's quite an experience yeah that's quite an entry point huh yeah, for, for me, the shock was a slightly different one. It was that it was kind of thinking you know what something is and then just seeing that thing just ripped apart in front of your eyes. Mm, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, that was the shock for me. Because I, I was a big fan of Gallo's Bird's Bark and um, I found it, you know, like very easy to get into and listen to. Yes, nice. And um, so for me, when I first heard Blueberry Boat, and there was a there was a buzz about it a bit, like it got some good reviews. And when I first heard it, I felt a bit overwhelmed. Like it 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 took me a while. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was like what you were saying, just kind of latching on the little details, right? And then you just they're like little islands you could find throughout the album where you just kind of cling to to survive until little by little you feel stable, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you so it was, yeah, it, it was nice today, uh, just this past week to go back and listen, cause I haven't listened to it in ages and I was surprised how much of it has remained intact in, in my head. <laughs> like, oh, I, I remember, you know, like it really, um, the memory of the album was very fresh in my head, even though it's so fragmented, right? So it, like my memory of it was much better than I thought it what, would be, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's it's amazing, kind of. It, you, you're surprised and yet feel like very familiar all at once. That's another one of the paradoxes of it, I suppose. Like it's an album that constantly surprises you, but it's surprising you with these things that you didn't realize had really kind of lodged themselves in your memory. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think partly that goes back to just sort of, despite how sort of chaotic it sounds it's the, the sense of fun and that it is very very good pop music in a in its own very sort of idiosyncratic way um the hooks are very effective hooks mm -hmm. you know but they're just not thrown together the way that you expect those things to be done mm. Should we... 
it, it's a bit like you have to kind of listen to it a little bit like ambient music you know you don't yeah. sort of, it, it's like the opposite of ambient because it's just all coming at you like it's constantly clamoring for your attention but at the same time it's there's so much of that that it becomes noise, which becomes mm. a sort of ambient noise. Yeah, sort it, of. it gives you the, the freedom to, to mm. plan into it. To, uh, yeah, exactly. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's musical flaneuring. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or jazz, I suppose. You could uh -huh. listen to it like a, like a, a jazz mm -hmm. album. Yeah, I mean, for, for sure, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Should we should we play a little piece just to give people oh, a taste? But the, the, the problem is like uh, lots of tracks are like ten minutes long. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll play. Uh, um, why not um, start with the um, the title track and just listen to as much of it as we feel is safe, okay. <laughs> as much as won't tax the patience of any um, any viewers. Maybe yes, any sane person. All right, just a moment. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to play a minute or two of the title track, Blueberry Boat. So, <laughs> yeah, I was just looking at some of the notes that I jotted down in advance, and one of the one of the notes I wrote was the sounds include a lot of cheap sounding synth and electronic bits, mm -hmm. 
And then I, I, I wrote, some weirdo in a rural shack creating a cyborg out of broken retro ephemera and rusty electronics. Yeah, that's mm. another paradox, like the, 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 the rock guitar, the Velvet Underground kind of guitars, and the, the cheap electronica, like mm -hmm. um, United... Yeah. Yeah. There's a sense of, like, there's this awareness of these kind of... You know, sounds that are sort of a bit harsh and kind of irritating. You know, mm. that I, I think that I, I think I've, I've, um, I feel like in the in the nineties or so, that's pretty much when punk rock and noise kind of like hit its limit of the the extent to which it was really subversive. You know, it just hit a point where it's like you can't really make things any louder than that or mm. more discordant than that. Mm. That just went to the extreme, and it, there was nowhere really to push beyond that as a way of, like, you hey, know, subverting. Hey, we are mute. No, no, no. no I hear you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you would have told us by now if we were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. The, you know, that went as far as it could go. And so, if you want to kind of make people uncomfortable with music, or if you want to play with people's sense of discomfort, then. I think irritation, irritating people, is something that you have. There are so many different ways you can do that, mm. and it's, it's a much but broader canvas to play but with. For me, it's, it's um, linked to the joy of creating stuff, like to surprise, yeah. to shock, to read mm -hmm. people is a part of the process of like, yeah, yeah. like doing uh, playful and a bit childish stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a way of kind of like breaking your mind, breaking the listener's mind open. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it goes back to the, what I was saying about the cardiac as well, because I just think they were a band that were very mm. good at using <laughs> using irritation as a way of... Uh, yeah, putting my foot spell that true. But her voice, I mean, the, the, I think that's true about what you're saying about the music, but then the way she's singing isn't challenging, right? Like, it's very... Mm. Like, that's kind of interesting that... um that style singing and that style music can go together is interesting you know yeah i mean that, it, again that's another one of the sort of i don't know if it's a paradox but uh you know it's a kind of sharp juxtaposition that kind of they're kind of throwing together in the music isn't it it's that they, they, there are these things that kind of try to drag you out of the music and then there are these other things that are pulling you right back in yeah, um, it's, a, it's a roller coaster, mm -hmm. like really, <laughs> like that, that song especially. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. those three minutes, it's like, whoa, God! Mm -hmm. It's also, I think, I, I was feeling like because I was listening to it very intently there, and we were saying before about how we don't really listen to, you're not really meant to listen to this that intently. It's better to kind of drift through it and pick out. And the album is very long, like mm. 70 minutes yeah. or something, something like that. But I was listening to that very intently and it, it it started getting a bit too much. It's like, oh my, there's so much in here, so much happening. You know, I was like, am I going to cry or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A 76, whoa. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, the album's 76. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're very generous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 76 minutes, shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How long is Daydream Nation? Uh, 60s? I don't know. It's longer than Daydream. This is longer than Daydream yeah, Nation, yeah, yeah. isn't it? It's like 76 minutes and uh, 3,000 IDs per minute. <laughs> yeah. we, we can do a check with that. Um, um, and I didn't realize that... Um, yeah. So the title never rolls off my tongue. Their first album, Gal Gal's Bird Bark. Gal's Bird's Bark. Gal's Bird's Bark. Um, the the songs on that are all like three minutes. Like I didn't. If if you just asked me, I I like some of those songs sound long to me, but they're actually not as long as you think. Um, mm -hmm. That's because they throw so they're still cramming so many ideas into three. Yeah. Minutes. So even even on the first album, there were you think they were they were doing that i, th I think that the all, all or most of the elements that you find on blueberry boat are there in the first album mm. but it's just it's easier to not notice them mm. um, or to not maybe realize how important they are 
But I think they found the perfect mm -hmm. formula for this album. Mm -hmm. the, the first one is excellent, but it's mm -hmm. still a little bit normal. And the next one, the next after Blueberry Bot, is like too ambitious. Like <laughs> I, we need to study it before listening to it, you know, like yeah. Ulysses or uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. But like um, Blueberry Bot is indeed a very ambitious album. Mm -hmm. Some people could find it uh, difficult to to listen to mm. but it's still very catchy very pop very entertaining mm. and like it's the perfect formula for me they they reached and they will try to do it again after um rehearsing my uh my my, my stuff my choir, my choir. choir. Yeah. and with bitter tea which is good but not as magical as blueberry but i, I think but it's never going to be as magical because it's not the first time anymore. You know? Yeah, yeah. Do you do you remember the first time? <laughs> <laughs> so re rehearsing my choir is that the one that involved their grandmother? Didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's one where I think you can't listen to that in the way that Blueberry Boat allows you to. You know that way of um, dipping in and out while listening. Rehearsing my choir, I think you have to listen to very carefully, yeah. properly, from start to end. It's, it's more With all uh, your attention. It's more spoken words than um, yeah than songs and and pop songs, and interviews of their grandmother. I I think it's interesting, maybe a little bit too much ambitious, and Pitchfork hated it. So which you can contradict the science. To, which it makes me want to like it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was I was just thinking actually. It's like God. I wonder what Chris Guy thought of this. He would have hated this, wouldn't he? Chris Guy would have hated it. Mm. It's not the kind of thing. It's the sort of thing that it's clearly it's like designed to trigger all of his kind of like uh these these shallow clever dick homo whatever you know the kind of thing that all the kinds of shit that he always hates oh, um, you know, so uh, you're, you're um New robert York, crisco uh, yeah. yeah robert crisco like it, when you're looking when i'm looking at reviews of like brilliant albums that i love and then you look at the kind of list of you know the reception section on like mm -hmm. wikipedia and it'll be like four stars five stars nine out of ten eight out of ten and then there'll be like one shitty review there and it's always chris guy yeah. oh, it's not, okay i don't know but it's not uh, kind of like, trick he doesn't like certain kinds of thing okay. i think that's all i say he yeah he, he kind of sneers at what he calls uh what he sees as um um i don't know what you'd call it like um um art that is really all about the form a mm. formalist yeah he doesn't like for he doesn't like or he doesn't dislike formalists he but he, he'll always praise it in this slightly kind of you know an, an edge of a sneer to his praise he he clearly i think he kind of he likes there to be and he, content. He won't like uh, Blueberry Book. I don't know. I just get the feeling that he would have hated it. That's all. Oh. <laughs> but, so, but do you think he would have liked the first album? I don't know. I think that their whole thing probably would have bothered him a bit. I don't know. I, I don't think they're. I don't know. I, I, I'm trying is, to I'm his, I'm his uh, title is it the Dean of American Music Critics or something like that? He has I have no idea. The, the Dean or what? I think it even says. I don't know. Um, um, I know that Sonic Youth killed him with their big fucking dick, though, didn't they? <laughs> what's what's the story there? I don't remember that. They 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 wrote a song called "I Killed Chris Guy with My Big Fucking Dick." Oh, <laughs> that's not very polite. <laughs> what what no, album? Sonic Youth. Like he, okay. he he criticized them a lot in their early days, and they were kind of like that they sort of like bit back at him a bit. But by the nineties, it's just I, I think they were like pretty much his favorite band mm. who ever existed by the end. Ah. Um, so you would, cause I disagree with this, this statement here, um, <clears throat> from, well, this is uncut reviewing it in 2008, right? So a retroactive <clears throat> review. Um, oh, oh, well, maybe the part I wanted to comment on, I did include, but they said something along the lines of the first album totally did not prepare us for the second album. But what you just said, Ian, is that you felt like a lot of the elements in Blueberry Boat were there mm -hmm. on the first. That that's how I felt. I I mm -hmm. did feel prepared to it to a degree. I think 
I think if you listen to Blueberry Boat first and then listen to the first album, you can be like, oh, yeah, I see how that brought exactly. there. Exactly, make it. Make, make it. Yeah. Yeah. But if you listen to the first album first and then Blueberry Boat, I think there was this kind of shock, like this sense of unpreparedness. I think what it is, is, you know, what I was saying is like, all those elements are in there. But I think when I was listening to the first album, I was hearing this kind of like blues influenced garage band post white stripes thing that was kind of the bit that was in focus for me when i was listening to it and then when blueberry boat came out suddenly it was just like this sharp kind of switch of focus into all this stuff that was going on in the background suddenly became the foreground and then those you know kind of like more traditional rockist elements became sort of like part of what it was doing but that wasn't it, it was that shift in focus that i think was the really mm -hmm. shocking thing about going from the first to mm -hmm. the second album mm -hmm. then going back to the first album the first album is like full of even more delights than i'd kind of realized when i first listened to it you know because now i my ears are trained to hear the, all this other stuff so i i can I sort of understand what they mean. Like there is this, there, there was this tremendous shock when this album came. Mm. I, I, I had it, um, but it's just now I listen back over it. Uh, it's like the first album is like, well, it's the one that I have on vinyl because it's the one that I, if I'm DJing, it's like I'm not playing anything <laughs> on this album if I'm DJing. <laughs> if I need to go to the toilet and there's a long queue, I can put something on maybe. But <laughs> yeah. what what track would you play? From the first one if you were DJing. <clears throat> um let me have a look. Good question. Um Tropical. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Too. Yeah. Totally. I don't know, it depends. Uh crystal clear, maybe. I'm not sure. Maybe crystal clear, I might go with. I don't know, it depends, uh, <laughs> depends on what the crowd looks like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so the on, on the album, the musicians on the album, I think it's kind of interesting that it just, it just says Eleanor and Matthew. Performance. It doesn't even um, specify what exactly they're doing. <laughs> and... Yeah. Uh, and they make sure that they get credit for packaging, which I think is is interesting. <laughs> um, huh. It, there's, I think, there's something about it that is kind of um, a celebration of the beautiful relationship between a brother and sister. I think, like, when you were saying, you know, it felt like they're playing a game, like the playful mm -hmm. elements, like exquisite corpse. And, but you get the feeling it could be a game, like a bunch of like inside mm. jokes that they have, like going back to their childhood. Mm. Like they know yeah. they feed off each other, you know? Yeah. It's childish in a very good way. It's very uh, playful. And when I listened to this album, uh, I got two, like, two, two kind of feelings. Like one is like back to the, the past, to the childhood, something very innocent and playful, something nostalgic. And mm. one, towards the future the ut utopia because like maybe it's like the the first velvet on the ground nobody bought it but people who bought and enjoyed this album mm. uh, created bands and stuff so like there's two opposite direction like back to the past and towards the, the utopia so like another paradox i just like thought about it. yeah mm. it it makes you want um to, to play music, to, to, to do art and to do stuff in a very, uh, like, uh, um, like without any complex uh, about respectability. I think it's a bit, it, um, you know, what me and Julian do, like, together is like, we, we'll just like, not every Sunday, but like most Sundays, we'll like just go off walking somewhere around Tokyo and we'll just, you know, without any kind of direction or map and just sort of wander around and just sort of look at the kind of chaos of the city and just talk nonsense oh, yeah. and we, we sort of drop down notes or Julian will often drop uh, drop down notes 
And um, then like a couple of months later, when we've forgotten what we were talking about, we'll look back over the notes and then try to kind of like remember what it was or try to imagine what we might have been talking about. And then we, we just sort of make these little kind of homemade zines that we just like throw around a few shops around Koenji and things. And I, I think that the sort of process, that kind of process is probably like on some sort of subliminal level, heavily influenced by both of us having kind of discovered this album at oh, a similar yeah. point yeah. in our lives, you know? Mm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so, oh, the other thing I, I just remembered as well, like you said about the whole kind of brother sister thing, like I was just looking and this album, it says like for dad, that's the kind of uh, mm -hmm. dedication. And I think all their albums were always dedicated to their parents or to one or other of their parents. But I remember reading somewhere that Matthew's first solo album, he dedicated it to Eleanor. Mm. But he he was like, well, when we made it together, it's our parents. But when I'm making it on my own, it's really her that I need to dedicate it to. Mm. Well, that was kind of interesting. Sort of, I don't know what it says as an insight into their kind of relationship, but they, they seem to have a close relationship, which I think is quite nice. Mm. You know, they're not just in it for the money together, you know. <laughs> um, we look at the... Uh, I think this is interesting just to look at the reviews of the album, right? So some of them are getting... Um, right <laughs> in any in any one like, whoa, whoa, whoa. enemy 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 had the balls to give it one oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like people giving it like three stars or something it's like, so half to ask uh, yeah yeah it's like oh pitchfork 9.6 yeah the science, the science, science. Yeah. <laughs> see that that might have been retro though you know like i think they originally gave it an eight point something and then nine a few years i don't know i don't know but i think but um it's always but, like one's giving it four stars or the A minus. For me, that's a kind of, they're pussying out there as well. You can see it's like, okay, this is brilliant, but they can tell that it's going to irritate some people. So they have to caveat it a little bit. That little yeah. minus is their way of caveating. It's like, don't be a, don't be a talk, so just give it five, give, give it a hundred percent or give it zero percent. Just no, no. I totally commit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Why why do you think NME would have been so harsh? Um probably no particular reason, probably just because um they wanted attention. Hmm. Like, oh. I don't know. It, I, I think it, it the enemy was a bit like that. They're like it, it's like it, it's may, maybe a slightly kind of old school kind of sort of nineties sort of attitude kind of still hanging over and in, into the early 2000s that it's like yeah don't go for the kind of middle brow kind of three out of five thing if you're uh, just pick an opinion and just go all in on that opinion mm. and um maybe it was just more fun to write if they were kind of if you if they took that mm. approach i don't know I think that's how you know it's going to be a classic when you see this much, you know, to this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, Julian, when you when you called it historical, uh, um, so do uh, a lot yeah. of bands cite it as an influence? Or, uh, or what, what did you mean by that? When I said uh, historical, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, like as I said said before, like for me, like it's like the the first Velvet Underground. Nobody bought it. Nobody really listened to it. Uh, but it it will be considered as a as a historical step in pop music when it will be more mature. But the essence of uh, okay, sorry, <laughs> yeah. So so for for me, uh, of course, it's historical because. Um, uh, it, it's an album very important in my life, but I'm sure that when people will really understand the yeah the the, the, the joy of making music, the, that this kind of very referenced but non pretentious kind of art, uh, they will know that this album uh, is something into pop music history, and it's a, it's the best of pop music since the Beatles. Mm. 
Mm. It's wow. Important. Like, <laughs> oh, no, but yeah, I, I assume this. Um, um, wow. Everything is inside. It. So, um, and it sounds very fresh and very new, like, uh, like when you discover a new kind of art, like when, you know, it's uh, like the, 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 the birth of something within you. And this, like, um, this kind of, um, well, it's not so common. Uh, so, like, I hope this will inspire lots of uh, lots of crazy crazy musicians um, to do more, like things like that. I just I, I just found um, Chris Guy's review of it. There you go, a blueberry bomb. bomb. He gave what one one bomb? He gave it a bomb. Oh, um, my icon means this is garbage don't pay any attention to it really? you can kind of wow. write a comment <laughs> wow <laughs> so there you go <laughs> wow yeah. wow and, and they're you know from new york or at least you know based in new york city right so he's um they're on his front doorstep and he's trashing i think he I, I think he gave the first album a sort of qualified thumbs up mm. um the second one he's like nah no nah. wow I think um, when what Julian was saying then about like about discovering a different kind of mm -hmm. art or a new mm -hmm. kind of art, I was thinking about like what the experience of listening to this album, what the kind of parallels are in other forms. Because I remember like reading a review of it and they were saying it's cinematic, and I remember thinking, but it's not though, is it? Mm. It's like that. What I was saying earlier about the how it's so kind of everything is like all up close on the details and just like up close in your face it, it doesn't have that kind of big picture sort it's of aspect. like on the cover like this he is one of the most spectacular musical creations of the recent times and i'm not sure i agree with this kind of, yes yeah, yeah, it's, it's a it's, it's a it's sorry. <laughs> like, yeah it's like if it's if it's like cinema then it's like one of those sort of mad 1970s films by like kind of Terry Yamashuji or like Jodorowsky or something mm. or like or it's like 1960s experimental theater or something like mm. that it, it's like it's more like that than it is cinema mm. you know? um or it's like channel surfing yeah. right mm. it, it's like channel yeah. surfing in the 80s or it's like um it's more, it's, you know, it's more like surfing the internet than it is like reading a novel. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so I think it, it's a sort of, it, it fosters a mode of listening that I think is more contemporary now even than perhaps it was at the time. It's, uh, mm. um, or the, you know, it's something, it's a mode of listening or a mode of consuming that had been accelerating all the way, you know, Mm -hmm. all the way through the sort of modern and postmodern age and it it feels very it, again like maybe that's part of what you were saying about mm, i'm okay uh, I the, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, to... yeah somebody's uh sorry somebody's messaging me um, <laughs> embarrassing like um even though it's all these broken pieces of like rock history and things but it um yeah it's kind of zooming ahead into this sort of chaotic information overload future that we've all just kind of learned to yeah chaotic and overload. yeah yeah that's a good definition yeah wow mm. it is it's I, kind of, uh retro cyberpunk i don't know it's, yeah uh, i hadn't connected it to technology in that way but then that, that makes sense i like that <laughs> mm. I don't know, but but I think an important aspect, though, if if it's channel surfing or web surfing, but but you as the listener have no control over it, right? Like mm. they're controlling when everything changes, right? Yeah, you see, you're watching them crowds. So watching <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the the changes always occur with such conviction. <laughs> such conviction like when you said she says then i joined the police force or something like it's always very a very sharp turn right mm -mm. i like that hmm. it's invigorating <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah exactly um there, there, there's something kind of beautiful in that um um you know it, it's a very 
straight they do it with a very straight face don't they like they'll mm. do something ab completely absurd with a very straight oh, face yeah, yeah. um, um. and there, there there's something liberating kind of watching that happen I think. Yeah, yeah no cynicism mm -hmm. at all like uh, yeah 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 and there's, there's another uh, strange relationship between parody and essence like mm. uh, it's uh obviously very uh parodic uh but uh, in the same time they they reach the essence of, of pop music i guess and uh, without any cynicism without uh like you know um uh postmodern like a uh, called cool uh, um kind of you know uh, at atmosphere at all like it's very very sincere in the same time mm -hmm. and uh, i like i like this uh, this kind of attitude towards music yeah there's no darkness on here i would say i can't think of uh, well, that one line you could really cut my dark. throat you could cut my throat as so i slit my throat but you can't take the contents of my blueberry boat i think so even she could say slit my throat but it still doesn't feel especially dark to me is that this the album bit there's like one where there's this some of the lyrics are talking about um this like really kind of um bizarre kind of like child abuse story where she's talking about like being sort of held captive and being forced to take pills to stop her from growing older oh was that on this album or one of the other ones yeah this, this i wish little... i wish i wish i was back in chicago du, 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 du. <laughs> i don't know to keep me from growing older like something like that um, you could be right you could be right kind of, i remember that bit it was kind of reminded me of um you know that the, the sort of but it's all done in this kind of dreamlike way that you, you don't sort of, yeah, you don't get subsumed by the darkness of it, even when she's talking about something very dark. It reminds me of The Knife. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And there's uh, Brothers and Sisters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, no, yeah, yeah. There's something kind of in their lyrics that was always, there's a similar sort of vibe I get from them sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, or like a children's book that has a touch of darkness. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Should we, should we try to find that track, maybe? <laughs> um, you might need to pause to get... Yeah, well, let, let, let's... It's very dense. Yeah, um, let, let's pause. Let's pause. No, let's, uh, okay, no. Just, just to ask a random question, since we mentioned um, how it was commenting on technology to some degree, um, how would you compare this album to OK Computer by Radiohead? Well, in the, like... Um, first in in a in the multiverse somewhere <laughs> in a better world this album is most important than okay computer and like um i know it ex it exists somewhere so first and then um okay computer is obviously a, a good album but it's it's heavy he's it's charmless uh the mood is bad like it's depressing like and this album is the exact opposite it's charming entertaining it's uh, on a good mood and like uh, inspiring you don't want to uh, to stay in your futon uh like uh, all day long when you listen to this album mm. so like for me it's the the opposite and it's uh i don't know what, uh, what... I don't, it's like um well, they, I think that there is a lot of humor in um, OK Computer and Radiohead. Not on purpose. And I think I think it, there is, but it's like always it's always in the form of like, look at us, look at us make this joke. You see, we're not all serious. We're mm -hmm. we're making a joke here. I'm very uh -huh. serious about making jokes. <laughs> and, um, oh, like uh, Elon Musk. On <laughs> maybe not Sorry. quite as embarrassing as that, but um, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's um, like you, you said, like commenting on. Um, sort of technology i don't know if this album's like strictly commenting on it but it's just the way that they the way that it's done is like the form itself is a kind of reflection or a kind of uh it's sort of analogous to some um aspects of technology and so you know it you know if, if i'm gonna make a kind of uh a sort of quippy one-liner about it it's like this is this album is doing what um 
is doing for real what like radiohead talk about doing <laughs> you know with their albums um i i don't know how true that is or you know that maybe that's just like yeah i'm just sort of making a quit for the sake of sounding smart in a one-liner or something <laughs> but so um, I, I think it, it, it's in this album it's just it's in the process it's like um a lot of broken kind of rusty old retro elements but they're working together and playing together in a way that feels very very contemporary to me and like as time goes by i feel like more and more so mm -hmm. um so have have we already seen like the children of this album the the artists that have been influenced by this um i don't know influenced by this but I, it's like, I think you can hear some of what this album is doing. And like I said, I don't think these artists were listening to this album particularly, mm. but you can hear a bit of what this album's doing in like, you know, like, um, are, are you familiar with, with hyperpop? Oh, you it's, mean the, the genre hyperpop? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard like some of what, it. Yeah. What the hyperpop kind of kids are doing, mm. there's some element of what they're doing in that. It's, what is hyperpop? just sort of extremely kind of in your face sort of uh, <laughs> contemporary um i don't know how you'd sort of describe it um it's like it's pop just like cranked up to like beyond the point where it's pop and into the point where it's sort of like duh, 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 back off shut time you know mm. um Often made like with quite cheap equipment, and oh, yeah, um, yeah. that sounds very very funny. Yeah, it doesn't it, it doesn't sound like this, and I don't think those kids are necessarily listening to this. But I, I think it's there are some parallels between what it's doing and what mm -hmm. they're doing here. Um, What's that um, band? Is it One Hundred Gex or something like that? There's a band, yeah, that hyper pop, but um. It's like thrash pop almost, like just yeah. like sped up to a yeah. And it's not it's, it's a genre that's not very sort of really clear on what it is either. I, I remember like going, I, I went through this like Twitter thread, like um, just making fun of it, just sort of saying, just pulling up bands from all over the place and sort of saying, oh, this is hyper pop. And I, th I think there was a point where I got back just going back and back and back into the past and i was like sparks are hyper pop mm. you know and then somebody kind of commented under that with like this sparks cover by this hyper pop band it's like okay maybe turns out they were you know <laughs> i was just like fucking around but yeah well shall shall we listen to another track yeah oh, let's yeah. listen to the one with the creepy lyrics yes 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 i just want to introduce which song that is okay so it's track nine Spaniolated. <laughs> Spaniolated, <laughs> right? And she talks about Spaniolated before. I've been, you know, been Spaniolated. <laughs> yeah. <a> normal thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's got something to do with Spain, right? She's in Spain <laughs> in, the, in the song. Uh, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. So let's uh let's check that out. <laughs> Bird lap bags 
said, how you doing, my daughter? He put me in the hole of his old rusty crawler And fed me three pills a day to keep me from getting taller Um, I don't think I ever read that as being dark when when he gives her the pills to keep her from getting taller. I I thought it was just kind of an extended childhood, like. Mm, me too. Yeah, yeah. I understood this in the same way. Yeah. yeah. Extended ch uh, childhood. Yeah, I think yeah. She's walking home and she meets a man with a burlap sack and yeah. he finds her in a pit. It's, I mean, yeah, like it, but the, the, there is this sort of layer of kind of unreality to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, dreamlike the, kind of Alice kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that sort of turns it into, yeah, that, that maybe kind of um, encourages this sort of more allegorical way of listening. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And the, the final um, words like the pain, the pain in Spain falls mainly on me. Like it's difficult not to to laugh. Yeah, well, it's, it's um, that, that's also that's my fair lady as well, isn't it? Oh, okay. You know, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain. Oh, okay. It's a yeah. sort of um, pronunciation um, exercise that, that there's a sort of song about it in the musical My Fair Lady. Yeah, and the, the, the pure pleasure to play with words, like, mm. even if it's nonsensical, not very sensible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you guys know what TCBY is? She mentions. She it's says, TCBY, I, uh, not some American thing. It is, yeah. She <laughs> says, I, I walked home from the TCBY. It's uh, the, the country's best yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like uh, James Joyce said, like uh, when he wrote uh, after he wrote Finnegan's Wake, he said, like, okay, university teachers would be busy for uh, I don't remember like uh, two thousand years or I don't, but I think we can <laughs> uh, spend our lifetime to analyze <laughs> and all the references and stuff in this in this album. Yeah, totally. It's interesting they they have like those very sort of specific kind of cultural and sort of references to you know bits of like american life but then you know e even when they're doing their british songs they, there's a lot of songs like elements of like britain that you would not expect an american to casually know they mm. they get in there they know the names of like particular streets and places in london and that they'll kind of drop that into the song very sort of mm -hmm. casually like i think on the first album more than on this one but like on chief Chief Inspector Blanchflower, like the kind, 
their depiction of that very particular sort of like British pop culture is very, uh, it's very on point. Mm. Like it doesn't read like an outsider's view. It it feels like somebody who kind of really knows that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, they, yeah, maybe it goes back to what we were saying about specifics. They they're very good at picking out specifics that immediately make you see ah oh, yeah, like epiphanies yeah um, these very sort of um mm -hmm. uh yeah believable um evocative singular details it's not a cider it's a woodpecker cider you know <laughs> yeah so local for us we say that <laughs> yeah that's one of those rhymes as well like like i i've got a thing about this about you know there's there's words that rhyme and then there are kind of like off rhymes words that don't quite rhyme but they kind of sound very nice and, and you know and I, th those are often better than real rhymes but then there's this kind of those tricky rhymes where it's not a, a rhyme at all it's just the same word or the same sound Rhyming the word cider with fratricider, it's like, it, mm. it feels awkward because it's, that's just cider twice, isn't it? Mm. You know, um, it, it's, I, I was thinking about it like recently because of a Peter Gabriel song, it was um, like Games Without Frontiers, oh, that's no. a, a, a line in that, I can't remember which one it is now, um, but uh, um, yeah. It's like rhyming, I think he rhymes the word tears with frontiers in that mm. song. It's like, it's just tears twice. <laughs> I don't know, anyway. Black um, Sabbath, war pigs, masses with masses at the very beginning. Yeah. Generals gathered in their masses just like witches of black masses. Yeah. I mean, th there's also like rhymes where you're literally rhyming the exact same word. Like the kinks do that, like in Lola, isn't it? They rhyme the word cola with the word cola mm. in that. But it's like they're two different words, but they're just exactly the same kind of, mm. you know, they're just homophones, you know. Um, I, I always think that's, that's a sort of, it's a very tricky kind of way of rhyming. Yeah, I, yeah. I always admire it. When no, I hear no it. complex. You yeah. can do that too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, sorry, it's a little thing. But oh, it's good. I know, it's like, that's, that's what it's all about, right? The little things. The little things, the details, yeah. This album. Um, so when they toured around this time, they were performing with members of Sebado, right? How right. Did... There, there was a period. I can't remember when that was, but yeah, like the backline was from Sebado, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah so I, I saw them in 2005 um, at Daikon Yama unit. Mm. I think I think it was this lineup, right? So um, you got Jason Lowenstein or Lowenstein and um, Bob... D'Amico, mm. the drummer, yeah. D'Amico, yeah, from Sebado. Um, so pretty kill killer band they had. <laughs> and how how was the gig? Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. Was it similar to the album versions of the songs, or? Yeah, uh, yeah, yes. I I that that's how I remember it. Like the songs from the first album that you know they just kind of played in in anything they played off blueberry boat it, it still had that very fractured feel and it felt um but it felt like they must have rehearsed i mean it just <laughs> they put it together so perfectly that it was just amazing to watch them do it live right another great band i missed yeah yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. but they're um they're back together apparently yeah yeah they, they put out a single a couple of years ago mm. it was all right so maybe i mean the fact that they came to japan once maybe they'll come back right yeah i don't know i mean i, I don't know how much sort of residual sort of memory there is of them here or um mm. but there's a few people i know who like in the japanese music scene who really really like them mm. and i think they're one of those bands that are sort of they're one of those bands now where if you find someone else who likes them, it's like, ah, oh, we're brothers, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was delighted that you chose this album today. So 
because yeah to me they do feel they seem like a band that a lot of i don't know they were overlooked to some degree right yeah i mean it was a weird i guess another paradox of theirs that there was this sort of they they kind of rose to attention on a wave of hype but at the same time oh. i think maybe they were hyped for being something that they weren't so they never quite maybe they were never fully understood or appreciated for what they were actually good at. Until, I mean, they, they were, but... Until us uh, today, you know. yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Really, they were, because there were some great reviews in there, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Well, it it is true, though. I was So I was looking on YouTube if there were any other, like, YouTuber-type reviews of this album, and no. Oh, no. So no, we okay. will be the first people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mm. Well, one thing I de I definitely wanted to mention because um, so right they're from they grew up in Oak Park, uh, part of Chicago, which is where my sister lives. Oh, and, um, with her family, and the Friedbergers, right? Matthew and Eleanor graduated from Oak Park River Forest High School, which is where my niece and nephew go to high school. Oi. Oh, oh. And which kind of place is it? It's a pu public high school, like in, um, uh, in pretty much in the heart of Chicago. So it's like a city type school, as far as far as I understand. Uh, Ernest Hemingway went there, so that's a, oh, nice. that's a pretty famous. <laughs> He's a pretty big deal. But I think anyone um, famous that went to my high school. But the but this I thought this was interesting. I found this the high school honored Eleanor. This is from. 2016 they gave her an award right for outstanding tradition of excellence alumni who have excelled professionally and are making oak park river forest proud so they gave eleanor but i think it's interesting they gave eleanor but not matthew <laughs> an award <laughs> and matthew also graduated i found you know from here i found it on the wikipedia so here they're saying uh, Eleanor Friedberger, singer-songwriter, who was unable to attend. Okay, <laughs> so Friedberger and her brother formed the band Fiery Furnaces. But again, it's funny because Matthew also graduated there. But even here, they only refer to him as her brother. <laughs> yeah, maybe okay. so maybe there's some school history there about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah look at... <laughs> See, but then I thought of that line. Remember the line from the album where he says, um, I didn't get the grades I needed or something? Uh, oh, yeah, that's in um, Chief Inspector Blanchflower. It's in the confusing beginning part. It, and he, it's one of the parts he's singing, right? Yeah, it's the, uh, the opening part. What, what yeah, is he like, saying? Um, oh, I didn't yeah. get enough good grades, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe, oh, yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah maybe, maybe, like, maybe he was a bit of a... A difficult student yeah it's, it's he, he repeats it twice like i didn't get enough <laughs> good grades my <laughs> uncle peter had the pattern on business ma machine remediation outfit <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay uh, but but if you look on the uh you know i kind of went down this rabbit hole but if you look on this um this school's wikipedia page they list both both Friedbergers is graduating from there, but they only honor Eleanor. <laughs> For some reason, yeah. yeah. No question, no question. Better grades. Yeah. Mm. Maybe she's more charming, I guess. Don't let anyone tell you grades don't matter. <laughs> it's not, a, it's a tradition of excellence. Which she is continuing. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? okay yes so we, uh, we were talking about um perhaps the tracks we've played so far have all been eleanor's singing right mm -hmm. but matthew does come in and out on the album and i really like his vocals also yeah me too because like he he sings less than uh, his sister but it's like uh, always like uh, very nice when he his voice appears and um, but I don't want to uh, hear uh, him more. Like, I think it's, it's the kind of perfect balance. I don't know what, what you think about it, you know? Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, she, she has a more 
more of a kind of singer's voice mm. than him. And his voice is like this kind of, it's almost like a sort of commentary in the background on, <laughs> um, it, it's a much more sort of, he has a much more conversational tone and rhythm. Yeah, and the next album uh, is like mostly spoken words. So like maybe it, it was like here, uh, even yeah um, from blueberry box like this kind of yeah flat comments and... yeah yeah sure i mean i think it's the way they work together that's mm. sort of important as well like that um you cannot you can often you can feel this contrast between this much the much fuller sound of eleanor's voice and then this sort of um yeah slightly sort of conversational kind of nasal sounding voice mm. that matthew has um I, I i it's been something that's very very important to me in like the musical activities i've been doing in japan like about um i i like bands i've always liked bands where there's a male and a female vocalist playing off each other um the some of the first releases that my label um put out there's a band called mir oh, yeah. and they, it was like yeah male and female vocals in there and um Hyaka, who again like they, this band from Fukuoka and they'd often have the same sort of dynamic going on and um, even like the name of the label Call and Response Records like there's sort of an element of that in mm. sort of um, I that's not the meaning that I usually kind of say the label has but it definitely just my attraction to that kind of vocal dynamic mm -hmm. is um, uh Yeah, but I feel it's very funny in this case. It's a good balance, even mm. like uh, he's quite uh, rare when when he, he he sings. It's quite few few times in the album. But... And if they need to say something that if they need to deliver something that sounds very that sounds very sort of down to earth and real, his voice is a very good voice mm. to deliver those bits That's... of the music as well. Mm. Like her voice is is very good for delivering the kind of the flights of fancy, the flights of fancy, and the kind of you know these sort of diversions into fairy tale and dream, and um, he's and very, emotion and lyrical stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, the the microphone and the jumpy uh, yeah. way she sings in body brain. Yeah, well, you can see it's like the in the... Bouncy, yeah, in Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to go back to Chief Inspector Blanchflower again, the way the song kind of jumps between these three parts, it opens with Matthew's voice and he's talking about himself and his sort of, sort of struggles at school or something. I mean, I don't know if that's him specifically he's talking about, but it sounds like life in america in some sort of way and then the bit at the end that's him as well the kind of like you oh. know kitchen sink drama murder story about the guy and his brother and his ex-wife and then it's in the middle when it just goes away to this jumps across the atlantic and it's this sort of ludicrous tv drama mm. it, you know th this kind of layer of heightened reality sudden so that's where eleanor's voice comes in and that's the bit that she carries off so beautifully, you know. Maybe there's some, some of that to it. I, I mean, I'll, I'll listen to it now and I'll and I'll be like, oh no, the opposite's true, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. there's so much going on in there. But, mm. yeah, but you know, as, you, as we said before, like uh, the opposite is always true. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Whatever you say, the opposite is yeah, also yeah. in this. You have to find the opposite. Yeah, because yeah. everything is in here. That's the mm -hmm. thing. Like, it's all in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, well, like I said, I was a bit uh, reluctant to show this photo because I feel like I look like such a fanboy, right? But I did have a <laughs> chance to talk to Eleanor in 2005 in Tokyo. So hey, no. I have a memento of it. You can kind of Kirin Lager there. Oh, yeah. Mm. So um, you, th you think we'll go out with that part of... Chris Michaels. Today. Oh yeah, oh, that's a beautiful yeah, song. Yeah. Excellent. That's an, a great kind of example of like what's good about both of their voices as well. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's just a bit beautiful little snippet. I think. Right. Um, okay. Well, anything, anything you guys would like to say in closing, or what do you think? 
I was thinking about like some stupid stuff <laughs> to, to, but like there's some some album albums I want to to visit just to visit as a tourist and some albums I want to to leave inside and this is what the album I, I want to leave um inside all all my life in their house or you know in their boat I don't know but like I, I like being a, a part of this of this universe of joy and creativity so mm. I, I will con uh, conclude with this but I, I i i think this is an album that i'd burn myself out and kind of go insane if i lived inside it it's one that i want to visit <laughs> <laughs> but it's one that i kind of wanted i i i was I want to make sure that I always take a little bit of it with me whenever I kind of leave. Are you want to rob the house? Yeah, I'm gonna. I want to yeah. rob the house. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted like visit and then just maybe steal some of the cutlery. Uh, on steal the, the fire of the burning house. <laughs> <laughs> steal some of the blueberries, right? Blueberries, I, uh, sure. Don't don't eat those blueberries. They're they're, they're dangerous. I will. I will definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining me on Christmas Day. Right. Awesome. So, Again, yeah. Thank you for having uh, us. Merry Christmas. That was a blast. Right? <laughs> and um, all right. So we're going to we're going to go out with uh, part of Chris Michaels. Just Chris like my, my, Yeah. <laughs> Is it? OK, so Merry, Merry Chris Michaels, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Franklin Park Hockey Club Went to Gonzo's and bought a gold glove Jessica, supposed to meet him back on Manheim Kitchen back door by all the greasy grime Was a little bird in my back door Said your true love's let you down Was a little bird in my window Said that he's been running round Working up the courage so to leave you He's getting ready to say he don't love you Well, Tony took it all in stride Said don't be silly but wondered who inspired Jessica driving down Wolf Road Roll up the windows, baby, talking cold I'm the little bird at your back door Said your true love's let you down I'm the little bird through your chimney Said that he's been running round He's working up the courage so to leave you He's getting ready to say he don't love you Then she bumped in the purse and stole a credit card Right in Chris Michaels, no one was at home Number five terminal with the yogurt cup Reading the young miss as she slurps it up Nasty message when it don't pick up Lay over eight and watch the local news 99 and humid all the red sea blues Landon and Delhi take a third class train Umbrella vendor in the autumn rain Then the cops come by and ask your name With this chill I'm in
another track. <laughs> we have 